morning. Welcome to Shamble State Home Festival. Week six. We weren't certain there'd be a week six. There is a week six. Uh, not merely week six of this. I mean, literally, we didn't know if there was going to be a week six at all. Um, and uh, we are joined again. We'll, we'll, we'll meet him shortly uh, with our first guest of the Stay at Home Festival, uh, Mark Gatiss. So we're going to be talking about, well, going through all of the, there's about seven pages of questions you sent last time that we didn't get through. And uh, so we're going to be going through that. Uh, I'll tell you a couple of things that are coming up, which is tomorrow we've got Dr. Carl on the show. So if you have any science questions you'd like to ask him, and uh good morning Josie good morning the uh tones of my daughter crying and calling for mummy so it's a beautiful day here in East London how are you this is the nice thing for you this is a break for your partner Johnny this is a constant reminder that you are the loved not him so there's a there's two very different things going on here She's having a very big phase of that and it is absolutely punishing for him. So basically anything he tries to do, she's like, no, mommy, do this. How <laughs> dare you? <laughs> Can't oh. say enjoying it. It is. Um, so I was going to I was going to quickly I was going to I was going to quickly mention we've got uh, as people know who who regularly watch this, we have a tip jar at the bottom. And uh, what we're aiming to do is get as much money together as possible to work as a resource for people who work in the arts industries and for uh, art centres as well. A lot. Of, in fact, this is the week. I don't know if you've noticed it, Josie. It was last week that I've really noticed now as things start to fracture and crack. I think both human beings, I've noticed a lot more in the last week, people now watching their kind of their their uh, messages on on social media that people feel a little bit fragmenting and i think also things like a lot of industries and a lot of areas people are going oh right this is going to be really hard to hold it together i think this week i found it personally really difficult this past week as well and lots of friends have i think it must be something to do with you know that length of time you're managing you have a dip you're managing you think okay this is fine then suddenly it's like you just open on this whole stark vista for miles and miles and you're like oh i thought i was at the seaside <laughs> i've got uh, years more of trekking and um, yes uh, we are donating to venues as well there's a venue in bradford that we're donating to that i love that helped us um, um, a while back when we were doing um, silly uh, art tour uh, ad hoc happening gigs there um, and it's called the one in 12 and it's um, it's it, I love the objectives on the Wikipedia page uh, the original objectives of the club were to develop and spread the anarchist values of self-management cooperation and mutual aid well of course everyone is part of a mutual aid group at the moment so we're all anarchists now so I think it's very important to um, donate to people that are going to be organizing that a lot within their community but it's a brilliant venue where like grace petrie's played and i've played yeah. and i haven't so uh i don't want any of my well, what's going Scab. on no I, well well good this i'll make my little list of where it has to book me now due to a donation the whole thing's <laughs> a payola scam uh we've also given this week again to uh the caution uh the pound art center which is a really beautiful art center where i've also played with grace petrie i've also played with grace petrie and uh laura from she makes war uh, amongst others and uh also the uh the witham up in barnard castle some of you know barnard castle not far from durham there uh where barnard castle itself has an incredible collection of jewelry Cabbage eggs and uh, a mechanical swan. So, but none of the money is going to the mechanical swan. It's going to the art centre down the road, just in case people are wondering. So, I, I just think mechanical swans neglected at this difficult and critical time. I think. Do you know what? They've always been the first victims. It has always been the clockwork <laughs> menagerie that has been the first to go in any of these kind of disasters. Um, I'm just thinking about starting off bleakly because I've generally been reasonably kind of content and I've, I've been enjoying doing the homework and stuff with my 12 year old and realising, you know, that's good. But I thought I don't start the day with the news. I, I start the day with something positive. So I was reading a Jane Goodall lecture this morning. Frankly, reading about the cannibalism of chimpanzee children has not set me off well on a Monday. Oh, you'd be better off reading the news. I think I was, it, it hit me hard. There was it's, it's a lecture that she did in Edinburgh. Jane Goodall, who is, is such a wonderful, in, in, incredible uh, communicator and campaigner and the work she's done was so important. But as she talks about the first time of witnessing two female chimpanzees going over to another one and then just grabbing the baby and then eating it. Yeah, that was an error. An error of Monday reading. That is very much Thursday reading. Well, thank God you've passed it on to all of us. <laughs> <laughs> God, yeah. God almighty. Wow. What a way to start the day. Have you got a show and tell for us this morning? I by the way? do. And it's nice. Thank God. It's not just cobbled together. So yesterday, as we were quite a difficult day, I was finding it very hard to sort of just weather, weather the day. And I did some yoga at about half past four in this bedroom. 
uh, being one of the two rooms in the flat. And um, I was sort of just trying to bring myself to a state of, of, of a bit more calm and a bit more uh, happiness. Oh, my daughter's opened the door. And anyway, I was sitting on the mat and I re- sort of came into vision. I wonder, and I can't turn this around because there's only a camera on one side. So let me know when it's there. It should be on the picture. Can you see yeah, the picture? Yeah, you can see that. Um, so it's a picture by Mark Chagall um, called The Wedding. Hello, baby boo. Hello. Yes, baby boo. Um, it's a picture called The Wedding by Mark Chagall. And I love him so much as a painter. I just think he's a fantastic... Get up, but you're going with daddy. He's a fantastic... Um, fantastic um, Come sit with me. You have to just mute my face. This is very much what this is what the Sisty Wendy Wendy Beckett shows really lack. <laughs> that's that's the difference that's between the you and the nun. Um, but basically, Mommy, um, headphones. Mummy's headphones hasn't got the headphones on today. Clever girl. Um, I basic, um they're so full of love and so full of joy and colour and energy that I find them very heartening. And I find him as a as a, as a painter, he's always about um like what it is to be sort of vigorous and excited and loving but also just from a very simple point of view it's this picture of this blissful couple in love who've just got married and there's just a bloody big chicken next to them for no reason <laughs> just a bloody big chicken and that's the great thing about 20th century art that was uh um Sweet. now uh the uh um this is um, my show and tell. Well, one of them was I, I was looking for. Oh, I've got. I, I was looking for. I've got a load of T-shirts. Of, I thought because Mark was on the, the things like the uh, Doctor Fibes Clockwork Band and stuff. They're, they're they're T-shirts as if you bought merchandise by going to see things like the Jazz Band in Deep Red. Or oh. but the one that I'm wearing today is uh, Brotherhood of Sleep. I don't know if you can see that. Uh, <laughs> so that's a John Carpenter uh, based T-shirt. But while I was digging through, I found the tour T-shirt from last year's uh, tour that I did with Brian. And Cox and the reason that I got this out was just thinking that this time last year as opposed to being in my attic right that here are the tour dates this is how much of the world I don't know if you can see that we were kind of covering at the time so this time I would have just been about to leave to go to rally in North Carolina and then Wilmington Washington Philadelphia eventually finding myself in in, in Singa- Singapore ending up in uh, Reykjavik and it just feels very weird now to think that I was preparing to go around the world and now sometimes i prepare to go to the bins it's just, <laughs> just a change um anyway that's my show and tell and uh we will now introduce our guest for today our first uh return uh guest uh, guest mark gatis, mark gatis. Hello. hello mark how are you hello i feel like i'm doing desert island disc again it's, it's a sort of rare honor after <laughs> six weeks to i return. feel like this is part of some sort of where we're now going, so Mark, show us what you got up to in the last six weeks. <laughs> well, it's the same. <laughs> I've actually, I know I have, I've moved, I've actually, I know I have, I've moved my office from upstairs to down here. So uh, the backdrop, the backdrop is different. Although I'm getting very jealous of these Zoom backgrounds everyone's using, which look like uh, early 70s Doctor Who. And I want to, some of them are fantastic. Now, bear with me, my laptop doesn't support them so yes, mine doesn't it's yeah, so but, but, but if you try it what you get is a fantastic sort of solarized green death effect it's really <laughs> fant- really fringy and crude it's brilliant so i'm using that anyway just because it's more fun <laughs> so have you um uh, in terms of like moving around is, is that that's not the basement room that used to be your victorian laboratory is it no that was in the old house Old house oh, <laughs> long ago. Yes. Disappointing. No, uh, I paint. I, I I used to paint in this room, and now I moved it to my upstairs room and moved the office down. It used to be my office. It's all very confusing. It's the sort of thing you do in lockdown, isn't it? We we started a massive tidy and sort out, which is I would have to say, like, I'm sure, like everybody else has has stalled. <laughs> but also, we've now got. That we've now got a room entirely full of black bags full of books that are going to go to charity shops when it's all over. But if you were to happen, if you to walk past the room, you would think it was a serial killer had been at work because it appears it's just huge black bags <laughs> looking like they're full of body parts ready but to be disposed not, of. And maybe they are. What about if, you, if, if you, you want to, yeah, you can't donate anything to charity at the moment that's sort of superfluous. So it's just pile stuff up. Yeah. Yeah. 
Nothing else. It's, it's sort of the opposite of what it's supposed because you're trying to have a sort out. All you do is actually create more, more, more clutter. But also you can't, if you have a gap, this gap, this is the problem. I always find that I got rid of about a thousand books last year and you have to get rid of them on the day. On the day you go, I'm going to go, I'm not going to read this again. I'm not going to read this again. I have to take this to, to the shop now. And if you then have a week in between, you go, looking back, this was quite mm. an important book in my okay. development. So that's another one that goes into what will eventually be the incinerated museum of Robin Ince. You know, all of those, mm. all of those things that I look about around my house and think the moment I'm dead, my wife will just go, well, we might as well just knock the house down. This horrible, wretched bibliophiles nightmare that he's created. None of it's worth it. Like some, some of... You've worked out a plan of your, your predecease then. <laughs> oh yeah i oh, oh i th i think it's uh I, i've lived very badly the paper cuts will get me in the end mark they've been building up they've been building yeah. up over years um this oh, is where your son well, will take over the mansion <laughs> like oh. the acker mansion <laughs> exactly exactly oh, it's so i went there once you know once, you know i went i vis I, I met forrest ackerman once uh in in la in 1993 i went to the acker mansion the famous wow. Place, yeah, it was quite extraordinary. Uh, Did you walk, had, in, walk round? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, he had. There is. There are things in there. I mean, they've, I, they, they've all been dispersed to the four winds now. But there were things in there that, that needed to be in the Smithsonian. He, he had. Uh, he had original Willis O'Brien armatures from the Lost World and Kong and things like that. And I don't know where they've gone. I mean, they must have gone somewhere. But it was quite extraordinary. I mean, he's the, like the original fan, isn't he? And he, he showed me, he had letters he'd written to, to Carl Lemley in the 30s saying, really enjoyed your recent feature, The Mummy. Will there be, will there be another? Things like that you can't actually conceive <laughs> that there was such a thing. But there they were. Be another. Yeah. <laughs> yes, we can tell you The Mummy's Hand is in pre-production. <laughs> Well, that is your your history of horror show, the the, the first three-parter. I mean, that, I, I kept thinking when I was watching it, how how do you when you were going to see some of these people legendary you know for us they they were images that we had had on on the inside books perhaps the postcards or post things we'd cut out from magazines and put on our wall and you're now meeting these people and they they're in the you know 90s or how did you approach i mean did it was it afterwards that you'd suddenly go oh my god this 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 person who was such an an, an influence on on the development of your art you've just met or are you sitting there all the time thinking, well, I really, if I screw this up, don't screw this up, don't screw this up. I've been waiting for 40 years for this. I'd be a bit of both, really. The, the strange thing was, I suppose, that that series, which is 10 years old now, was just, it was the last last chat. It was very well-timed. You know, by the time it was transmitted, three of them had died. That's how close it wow. was. And But, you know, I often think about... Um, uh, the wonderful Kevin Brownlow series, Hollywood, which you, if you remember that with James yeah. Mason, it's, it's utterly amazing. And it's all on YouTube, apart from one episode, which I think they had to take off for copyright reasons. So it's not, you can't have the whole thing. Anyway, it's utterly brilliant. It's about the development of silent movies. And even in 1980, when it was on, I, my jaw dropped the fact that he was just popping around to interview Ruben Mamoulian, King <laughs> Vidor, <laughs> and Gloria Swanson. And, it's absolutely inconceivable. So I went to America first time, 1993, and I tried to interview Gloria Stewart because she was in The Old Dark House, The Invisible Man, and a James Whale film called The Kiss Before the Mirror. And she's, I, I spoke to her on the phone, uh, and uh, I, rem I remember we parked the car outside her house, and there was a little green gate in this wall, and... And I'd spoken to her, I was hoping to sort of sort of doorstep her, I suppose. Eventually, she consented to speak on the phone, but she said, I'm too old, honey, nobody wants to see me anymore, all these things. Uh, this was four years before Titanic. And then 20 years later, nearly 20 years later, uh, more than 20 years later, I went through that green door and actually interviewed her for the series. And I remember that was the moment that I, really hit me. I thought that was a sense of my own personal history as well yeah. that it you know taken all that time and she was amazing she was a she was a hundred wow. and her recall of the 30s and founding the Screen Actors Guild with Boris Karloff it was incredible but the funniest part was bless her she was amazing uh, just just as a sort of courtesy 
Um, and I thought, we might as well get this on tape for all time. And I, as we were leaving, effectively, I said, could you just tell us briefly how you got the part in Titanic? <laughs> and she sort of sat back and closed her eyes and said, Mr. James Cameron, call me. 45 minutes later, we left, <laughs> we left the house. <laughs> Because she went, she had a lot. She had a lot to say about that, and, it, and, and we were so, we were literally packing up. We had to sit back down again and listen to it. But it was uh, it was a wonderful experience all round. It was meeting those legendary people, and also just you know, I suppose touching on all those things. And um, it completely reinvigorated my love of horror movies, uh, which yeah, as an obs- an obsessed child, I knew so much and everything about. It, it, you know, I just didn't, it had just like all, like all kinds of childhood interests, it had just sort of faded away. I still went to the pictures to see the odd horror film, but going back, diving back into it and then re- and then discovering all kinds of, of ones I never knew about, or you know, like the Mario Bava films, which, as you say, had only ever, we'd only ever really seen, apart from the odd one, as gigantic colour stills in Alan Frank books. Mm. And suddenly... They were, I mean, life changing those movies because I, I like them an awful lot more than some of my uh, earlier favourites, really. Um, it, was, uh, it was wonderful. Yeah. Oh, I knew it. I knew Sorry, it. I just had to grab Monsters and Vampires because I knew that was nearby. The, um, but that is, but that is, I, I, my son, we, we made him on New Year's Eve watch The Old Dark House and it stands up brilliantly it is i mean you I, I don't know if it was your first you'd written some doc two novels hadn't you before the james whale book that you wrote yes yes but yeah. but th- that james whale book which i think is a brilliant book by the way so it's, it's uh, both your book and, and jeremy's uh, jeremy dyson's book on uh, supernatural uh, horror as well oh yeah bright darkness that's fantastic but that that's an interesting thing where you suddenly return to because uh, I found that it's only in the last ten years that I've really I started digging around and finding. I, I was showing you this beforehand. I, I remembered where you know House of Hammer magazine, which meant so much to me. For those of you who don't know, it was uh, it used to have this rather wonderful. Uh, it would it would have uh, comic strip adaptations of Hammer movies. I love it. And and of course, for I don't know if you have the same thing, Mark, which was I would read those and then wait, and then eventually there'd be a horror double bill and Captain Kronos Vampire Hunter would be on. And of course, I hadn't realised that the special effects in the comic strip were far better than the special effects which are possible <laughs> with the low budget of it. I mean, I still like Captain Kronos, but it was going at that as your introduction to horror was such an incredible thing. And I think in the last 10 years, I've realised how important it was as well. It's very familiar story. That a lot of people have that with the target yeah. novelizations. If they, they read the book first and then eventually saw the TV version, so it wasn't as good, but that, that's the power of... Uh, of comics and and the printed word, isn't it? The, the strange thing about House of Hammer was I've, I'll, I'll boil this story down, but um, like you, I mean, it was the most incredibly exciting thing to find on the in the in W. H. Smiths, and uh, and then I had this very brief period where I was I had my own version of the sort of um, of the Hayes Code. My parents went to a parents' evening, and all my all my um, sort of essays and stories were horror stories all of them huh. and they just uh i've still got my school report from mr todd that said uh sweet todd sweet todd yes <laughs> it gave me an uh i got an a plus uh and it said uh out something like amazing imagination even if they do resemble scripts for hammer films i still got that <laughs> and when my parents came back and they basically banned me from watching horror movies they had it up and by her- horrific coincidence, that that night it was a Friday night, parents teachers and Revenge of Frankenstein was on a very rare Hammer film, still a rarity really, and in those days inconceivably rare. Never seen it, and I was sent to bed early crying because uh, they banned me. And I remember hearing my parents' door close, and I sort of looked at my watch, and it was about you know actually about twenty five past ten. And my sister was staying up to watch Revenge of Frankenstein. And I just crept downstairs and watched it anyway. And that was the end of my ban. <laughs> oh, that... But House of Hammer was one of those things. It was so I wasn't allowed and then I was allowed again. But then this weird thing happened. You'll remember this, Robin, where it it transformed suddenly into Hammer, the Hammer Halls of Horror. Yeah, uh, that's right. And I couldn't keep track of it. Something weird happened editorially. 
uh, and it wasn't the same. I can never. Did we ever get an explanation for what? It, it, it became. It was. It was House of Hammer, Halls of Hammer. I'll see if I can find. Uh, um, House of Hammer, uh, Halls of House Hammer. House of, of Horror. Then eventually became House of Horror. Yeah. That, that's Hall. the wonderful Captain the Kronos. Captain Kronos cover, yeah, yeah. which actually, by chance, look what's on the back there. There we oh. are. See, la revanche de Frankenstein. The House of Horror. You're right. For the last three oh. issues, Halls of Horror. So, but the story with this is that they did a brilliant uh, comic strip illustration of Dracula, Prince of Darkness, uh, and and there's a Father Shandor spin-off was promised, and it never materialised. And I met Des Skin, the original editor of Doctor Who magazine and editor of House of Hammer, years ago at a, at a Doctor Who thing. And I said, whatever happened to that Father Shandor spinoff? And he said, oh, it did appear, but it was in somewhere else. And it was like a strange, it was literally like, we've all got versions of this where you, you know, there's a question that bugs you when you're 13. Like, what are the lyrics to this song? And then every now and then in your life, like hundreds of years later, You'll get the answer and you go, oh. <laughs> and if you could, all you need to do is, is give that information to your younger self and it would have meant the world. But now it's just kind of go, oh, I see. <laughs> it was really strange. And I thought a little door had closed on a, on a, a fragment of my childhood because he explained what had happened to the Father Shandor spinoff. Anyway, this means nothing. So, so you don't you don't meet me, lend you. I've got those copies of Warrior magazine. Is that so where it's in Warrior? It, it, it was Warrior yes. magazine, which was also where Alan Moore's V for Vendetta began, okay. yeah, Laser, Razor, right. and Press Button, and all, all manner of things. If you were, uh, by the way, I feel that the first one of these we did was very broad, and I'm glad we've managed to narrow it down <laughs> a little bit more niche. Finally, it's it's a joy uh, to see you one issue talking. of one particular. <laughs> But it was those things. You're right. It, one of the saddest things I think is when you. It's like when you have to it's remind like when yourself. you have to remind yourself. Sometimes when you're working with someone who, when you were ten, you could not have imagined what it would be like. You know. Oh my. And I sometimes. You know. And I have to kind of just sit and go. Don't forget the wonder and the joy of this. Of the fact Absolutely. that. 10 year old me would not have you know when, when i was doing whenever i've done stuff with things like the goodies you know and and uh and i'd go remember 10 year old you remember somewhere there's a bundle of neurons that are still 10 year old you and don't let that bit of it die because the, the My problem is, it's most of your neurons is like, like <laughs> that's the truth yeah, I, was, I was gonna say my problem is that i'm still so there that when i uh, got to interview michael palin most of my questions were just you're very good aren't you yeah. <laughs> i remember you telling me about that you said, i don't know what happened there <laughs> but the joy of that is in michael, uh, uh, michael palin is the same with me one of the few people i I absolutely went to pieces when I first met. I couldn't quite believe it. And um, but he tells this brilliant story about uh, he was he did a bit in the Magic Christian, that very strange sixties film. And Peter Sellers, of course, was in. It. And he was such an obsessive goon fan. And he was uh, on the set of Pinewood or something. And he saw Sellers approaching, and he was his mind was racing. What am I going to say? What do I say? To, what on earth do I say to Peter Sellers? What do I say to Peter Sellers? And he sort of came level with him, and he just went, "I know Peter." <laughs> <laughs> that's all he can manage. <laughs> but there is a there is a thing is that to some it's extent to some extent where it is better even though we all want to meet our heroes it is better that they always remain not mm. necessarily i mean i've been lucky that and and i know joe to you as well with all of us i think we've met people who fortunately again perhaps because we've got niche taste perhaps it's not always really big showbiz taste that they are they 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 you know, you go, this is wonderful, and you delight in it, and it turns out they are what you'd hoped. I think, you know, the higher up sometimes, the really big stars, then the disparity. But that's the problem, isn't it? Which is, once the person becomes a human, you've lost the magic when they are merely the, the cover star of Halls of Horror, or whatever it might be. Yes, I guess so, but it, I mean, it's, it's worth it, isn't it? If, unless they're terribly disappointing, which of course can happen, uh, and it actually sort of destroys your your childhood love of something because you can't not unsee through a different kind of prism. But mostly of course, most mostly people are lovely and humble and, and kind and nice. And I met Christopher Lee several times and that was, you know, talking about, you you know, addressing your eight year old neurons. That was an extraordinary thing just to, to, to contemplate. And I found the last, the last time I really spent any time with him was, um, uh, I commissioned a friend of mine to do a, a picture of him. 
and we had tea in the Cadogan Hotel where Oscar Wilde was arrested, uh, not on the same day, and uh, <laughs> which is just around the corner from where he lived in Chelsea and uh, um, in, uh, near Sloan Square. And um, uh, he was, it was just amazing to spend that amount of time with him. And he was very, I realised that he was very, um, very grave, you know, and very sort of uh, pompous, actually, of course, yeah, everyone says that. But he also, he was very silly, he had a very silly sense of humour, you know, all that stuff with Peter Cushing where they did Sylvester and Tweety Pie together. And I thought, actually, if you approach him as a monolith, he reacts monolithically. And um, we fell into conversation about Sherlock Holmes, oddly enough. And, of course, he famously was the only actor to have played Mycroft and Sherlock Holmes. Um and was very proud of that fact. And at that stage, which must have been about 2000 and 2001, um, he was planning to do a, a Harry Allen Towers Sherlock Holmes film. May, Harry Allen Towers was still alive and working, producer of the, of the Fu Manchu movies. And uh, Malcolm McDowell was going to play Sherlock Holmes. And, and Christopher Lee was going to play Moriarty. And... Um, so he was going to do the triple, which is absolutely unprecedented. Obviously, he loved the idea of that. And I said, I said, you'll be playing Mrs. Hudson next. And he said, what? <laughs> and, then he, and then he just turned and just sort of slyly grumbled. Just went, boom, 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 boom. <laughs> <laughs> and I, I, I treasure that moment because he was like, you know, as I say, I think if people approached him in a particular way, he responded like that. And if you just got got in the right way, you could you could have a really good laugh. He had has fantastic stories. Do you know, do you know Prince Philip? The man is a boar. B O O R, a boar. <laughs> <laughs> See, that's one of the stranger Christopher Lee performances. He played Prince Philip in one of in one of the uh, royal wedding movies that was yeah. made during Royal Wedding Fever. I've never seen it, and I won't be ever seeing it. But what a, you know, those bizarre things that happened in that kind of that period of his career. I've seen it. Washington, isn't it? It's the Queen Mother. It's you know, those things are just an endless delight. If you, if you ever think that 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 period where Hollywood got Britain wrong, hmm. or if I got the rest of the world wrong, ended in the forties, just watch one of those. There's a there's a there's an amazing one, uh, the David Cassidy story. Weirdly enough, starring Mark McDowell as David Cassidy's father. But there's a bit he he, he met this woman in. Um, London on tour in the 70s and eventually they got married they were like the, they, they should have been together and then they weren't but the moment where David Cassidy meets this girl in Regent's Park Regent's Park Malibu <laughs> <laughs> it's so brilliant they've got an open top red bus which they've obviously hired in and that's about and then there's a sort of you know there's like a there's a gas lamp next to a palm tree and, <laughs> oh I, I absolutely love those things and the fact that it still happens is is just breathtaking. I think you think you know people can Google these things now. They they can they can Google what a London street looks like. There was some. Um, did you ever see Last Sedu see Last Seduction Two? I don't believe I did. It's a very <laughs> it, it's made by Terry Marcel, who directed Hawk the Slayer, uh, and uh, it was written by I forget his name of a, a good writer. It was his first job. He used to be in Delamitri, and he wrote the screenplay for Last Seduction Two. And uh, because they can't afford to go to New York, as far as I remember, it's Swansea that doubles as New York. Of so course, to show I mean, that it's New sense. York, they just have a kind of you know one of those American mailboxes, you know, one of those blue mailboxes, and someone rollerblades past it. So by watching the mailbox and a rollerblader, you go, oh, "Well, that's New York." <laughs> of course it's New York, isn't it? Um, we better go and uh, we've got uh, another guest, Susie Gage, and then we're going to come back and finally do these questions or there's going to be hell to pay if we don't do that. So. I'll keep to see a third third edition of this thing. <laughs> Yeah. Um, so Susie Gage, who has been on this before and, and who is a wonderful communicator of scientific ideas and does a great podcast, which is now a book called Say Why to Drugs. And she is also another uh, huge fan of, of horror movies. And in particular, uh, amongst other things, 1970s horror soundtracks by people such as Goblin. Yeah. And uh, so I think we're now going to go over to. Oh, no, I should also have just mentioned, by the way, I always do this halfway through an introduction. Don't forget the tip jar. We're collecting money for the arts industry. We've really we 
we've given it all out now so we've kind of run out and uh so i really hope you enjoy this and if you uh if you uh, afterwards just think oh do you know what there's a quid or whatever uh if, if enough of you do that that means we're able to give more money to uh another art center and also another artist and that is fantastic and that helps a great deal but now let's go back to uh Susie gage and she uh because she went i can't remember how to play these things but she's taken a break from learning chopin which is what she's been doing uh and now she's going to return i think to a goblin soundtrack so let's go over to Susie gage hi everyone i'm really sorry that i can't be with you today to talk about horror soundtracks which is basically one of my favorite things to talk about um as many of you or some of you might know as well as being an epidemiologist and a researcher and a podcaster and an author um, i also dabble a bit in music and when i lived in bristol i used to be in a band called il goblini which was a goblin covers band now goblin are horror soundtrack aficionados they were a 19 70s Italian band who did the soundtrack to loads of films, in particular Dario Argento films like Suspiria, Tenebrae, Profondo Rosso. Um, they also did the soundtrack to Dawn of the Dead. And their music pops up in quite a lot of other places as well. Charlie Brooker's quite a fan. They're quite often used in Screen Wipe and things like that. And one of their songs was also used in Shaun of the Dead. Um, but the problem with Goblin is that, well, not the problem, but the problem for me trying to play these songs on the piano is that uh, one of the things that's so great about Goblin is that it's really complicated sort of rhythms and melodies kind of interlocking, like the bass interlocks with the synths and the drums and everything kind of fits together. But it's very hard to then get that across on solo piano. But one of my favourite directors is John Carpenter and the music in his films I've always found really, really awesome and he does quite a lot of it himself as well so instead of playing you a goblin song i'm going to play you a john carpenter song and that's from his, possibly his most famous horror film halloween so enjoy <laughs> Welcome back. Uh, so thank you very much, Susie, for doing that. Susie is uh, uh, a huge fan. I was so annoyed. I was actually not merely did I miss John Carpenter live. I, I went playing his soundtracks. I actually was even offered twice free tickets. And I was doing uh, I can't remember what gig that I, I had, which was uh, immovable. Mark, did you go and see John Carpenter live? I didn't, I'm afraid. No, hey, same thing. I mean, you just you, you miss them, don't you? And just go, oh, that, that's gone. But I, having, you know, having spent some time with the great guy, uh, I, um, I was, I think I got, I think I've had my, my childhood John Carpenter fix. So that was okay. He was, a, he was, a, he's a dude. That's what he is. He's great. 
It's interesting. Uh, I watched an interview he did recently, and I don't think it, he he was having trouble with the interviewer because yeah. because the, the interviewer kept wanting to ask him about what he wanted to make next and all this kind. Of, and he said, I, "I'm done. I'm done mm-hmm. now. I've 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 done it. It doesn't matter. And I don't want to keep talking about my work. I want to talk about other people's work." Huh. He was very a lovely kind of gregarious mm-hmm. nature about the excitement of what's being made, and and a not a, not a bitter acceptance. Or it didn't certainly didn't come across. Just an acceptance of there's a body of work and i forget in the 80s how you know starman christine uh big trouble in little china then off to the, you know they live in and prince of dark he was leaping around in so many different places you know escape escape from new Very york the value of film i think i love i love that movie i absolutely love it um yeah i, I said that, i mean this is again it's 10 years ago i said uh, you know would you ever want to make a Western? I always thought he'd be making a great Western. He went, oh, sure. But, you know, there comes a time you got to put your feet up and watch some fucking basketball. <laughs> 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 Quite right. Well, I swore. So. No, I think it's the opposite of bitterness, to be engaged in what's new and supportive of what's new. It's That's you- why someone like Barry Cryer is so brilliant. I guess that, isn't he? Barry, who is, you know, I was listening to Radio 4 Extra yesterday and I was painting and... Uh, uh, there was a, an old edition of I'm sorry I've, I've read that again um, from '68 I think and, huh. and and Barry's lineage goes way way back but he's always been so interested in it, it, of course if you ask he'll talk to you about writing gags for Frankie Howard or whatever mm. it, but and but he's really always interested in what's next and it, it's an incredibly healthy attitude for anyone to have because you stop you stop being fossilized in your own little moment. And you're thinking, what you know, what what it's what Olivier did with you know, Olivier's entire world was was sh- was shaken and threatened by the arrival of John Osborne, and then within a couple of years, he asked Osborne to write a play for him, which became The Entertainer. And you think, well, that's the way to do it, isn't it? You 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 take it, you you meet it head on and go, well, what can we do together? What can you offer me? What can you do to save my career? That's that's all. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that's very much the subtext of it. Yes, very much the subtext. No, Sorry, I'm just going to say that Barry Crow is somebody who's always taken the time to get to know new comedians. And so most, you know, most comedians who've done radio stuff will be like, oh, yes, I know him, even yeah. though I'm 30 and he's 80. You know, everyone knows who he is and, and has had a friendly conversation with him where he's taken the time to be interested and. Yeah. No one loves jokes as much as him. I love that story. He said, I love that story. He said, when Willie Rushton and him used to do that show, Two Old Farts in the Night. Weirdly enough, they were probably <laughs> your, yours and my age, Mark. You know, <laughs> and we saw them as old people. And they... Um, <laughs> yes. Oh, I forgot. Sorry, I forgot that your agent keeps updating that page. The uh, playing age, 24 to 40. <laughs> the, um, but uh, he said one night when he walked off, Willie Rushton went, Barry, you've fallen out of love with the jokes. And he said it was the only night he said he realised that night he just delivered the jokes. Mm. He was not engaged with the jokes. And I think when you, I, I, I saw Barry doing a show with Colin Sell back in, in late January and he's still that. There's a lovely joke. He uh, it's, a, it's apparently Walter Matthau. He heard it first from Walter Matthau, right? And, and uh, I think it's a beautiful joke. And, and he'd ring people up. A friend of mine said, oh, God, I saw Barry's number. And I thought, oh, my God, I hope he's all right. And, of course, hello, just got a new joke. And uh, But the but Walter Matthau joke is that lovely one about a uh, man and a woman get married and, uh, and they, they go back to her house for, for, for the first night for the honeymoon night and the next morning he wakes up and he's just feeling wonderful and he walks into a bathroom and he can't believe it there's a dead horse in the bath and he goes oh my god darling there's a dead horse in the bath and she says well i never said i was tidy now that <laughs> <laughs> and I, I i love that there's a great division but let's get sorry some of these questions right we must go through these um and uh so the questions are well this is from owen parker who also went to Bretton hall um I'm afraid that's and, all we've got time for <laughs> and he uh um he also wrote the theme tune for the for this show very kindly as well and he just like to say is it true that royston vasey was based on denby dale the civil parish near Bretton hall no I mean, it's it's based on all all points north, all kinds of different parts of our respective northern upbringings. Denby Dale would have been a part of that from our Bretton Hall experience, but not specific. It's not specific. You can tell it's not it's not anywhere specific. When we when when we won the Golden Rose of Montreux, that's a moment. I tell you what, that that's a moment. That was a moment in 1999. That was because of the goodies winning winning it. 
And I knew the goodies had won it. And so it was an extraordinary thing to, to think that could have been a possibility. But I remember we were, we were flown out to Switzerland. Remember those days? And uh, at, a, at no notice, it was so exciting. But there was a, a, a sw the Swedish jurist who had awarded us the prize said that there were a lot of places in Sweden like Royston Vasey. You know, so everywhere claims it, really. <laughs> That is, there was a sad, there was mo a sad moment in. Uh, I did an event with the goodies back in in January, which of course is even 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 sadder now. But there was a thing. It was at the slapstick festival, and uh, the slapstick they dug up a bit of footage which they knew that Bill and Tim and and Graham hadn't seen, and it was them at at Montreux. And it was uh, them looking incredibly flamboyant, and you know, uh, the, you know Bill, Bill looked exactly as you'd imagine. Bill looked like the, you know, the kind of jazz rock musician. Tim looked wonderful, and and we showed this bit of footage, and it had a terrible effect because rather than them rejoice at seeing themselves in 1975, it brought a terrible air of melancholy. And it was one of those awful moments where, and I said to the organisers, I said, next time, never, never show that. But it was just this, and I, and I saw them watching it, going, look at us. Look at us! Look yeah, at the passing uh, of time, and of course that now feels even, you know, kind of stronger. Of course, with 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 uh, the, you know the sad death of, of Tim. Um, uh, Lisa wanted to know a, a few weeks ago whether you were going to bid on anything from the Peter Wingard auction. I suppose we should change that now. And did you manage to stay away from that Peter Wingard auction? Uh, I did. Uh, a friend of mine apparently has secured me some cufflinks, but it was too it was too dangerous. Of course it was. I mean, what? <laughs> You know, talking about trying to sort out stuff in your house. It's like, so we've made, we've got rid of all this stuff, all this junk. Now, here is Peter Wingard's caftan. <laughs> well, I I think what I've happened is that the room you were in last time is now just full of every single <laughs> yeah, that is true. And you're I've moved rooms for no weight, reason. Just pushing me downstairs. <laughs> <laughs> no, I stayed away. I've, I've learned my lesson with those sort of things. It, it's, it's better in the abstract, I think. You know. I think you're right. My, my, my friend Johnny Maines, has, uh, he, for his birthday, he was bought uh, a picture of some owls that Peter, Wing the... Peter Wingard had on his uh, wall and just one of his boxes of loads of bits of rings. You know, he had all of these strange jewellery boxes, a very kind of tatty looking kind of plastic rings. But so, so those, those are now his. He can pretend his hands are Peter Wingard's every now and again, but not when he's near Gloucester. <laughs> uh this is um uh, serena was uh wanted to know um do how do you feel having written so much horror drama and uncanny shows now that we feel as if we're living in a slightly uncanny world well i think it'll probably change people's i don't know you know I, i've said this i probably said this last time but it, it fascinates me that in uh, the depression uh, Paul, he wanted Busby Barclay music musicals, but they they also wanted Frankenstein. Mm. And uh, the the first horror boom is in the depths of of the worst depression of the twentieth century. So who knows? I mean, the 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 downloads of films like Contagion and everything have been enormous, haven't they? So you'd think people would want to go in the absolute opposite direction, but maybe they want a sort of bit of a bit of both. I don't know. I think there's, there's genuine escapism, and then there's also somehow. Some kind of mirroring is quite interesting, but also supernatural horror is is a different thing. We're going through a weird sort of domestic version of of an apocalypse. We always used to road road test. I mean, I ran in I ran into central London the other day, and it was you know apart from Daleks, it was exactly the way we imagined it. It <laughs> was Trafalgar Square. It's incredible. It's never been. I've never seen like that ever. Christmas morning, it's not that quiet. So you there's something uncanny about that. Uh, but whether that's going to be reflected in in art, in drama, I don't. I have no idea, really. I think I think there'll be. It might be a bit like nine eleven in the sense that there'll be some sort of interesting coded responses. There'll be things about people in in contained situations, and then Nicolas Cage will do a movie in five years' time called Lockdown, which is explicitly about. <laughs> I was thinking about that. How I I don't think I will want to Just watch thing about somebody who's trapped somewhere ever again. I want to watch things about people kind of running and jumping like that outside or like. Well, everyone's like, saying, aren't they? That you know they're watching movies and and what they're. Matthew Sweet was saying he was sort of watching something, just being distracted by their bookshelves and 
and then, <laughs> and then looking at them going outside and, and being in a crowd. I mean, that's the sort. It's like the new porn, isn't it? It's sort of footage of stereophonics gigs, but of the audience, <laughs> just to see what it used to be like. But it was, uh, yeah, strange. I have no idea. I have no idea. Um, Nick wants to. Um, Nick wants to know. He says, due to the League of Gentlemen uh, return and your role in Christmas Doctor Who, you made me cry twice in one evening. What will you do next with such powers? And it is true, you do have a a, a, a great way with with having those moments in in sometimes whether it's com I mean, League of Gentlemen have lots of those, but those moments where you suddenly feel so engaged to a character who we've thought of as grotesque, and then that sadness comes through do, do you have you ever had a moment where you you've uh does it remain for you do you sometimes write a moment of melancholy uh or, or of emotion which once it's been made and you sit down and, and you're watching it again that it can actually have an effect on you know like almost like tickling yourself you know the the opposite of that really uh i don't think it's not that conscious i mean you don't sort of say oh this is a melancholy bit right now I and mean, it's just what how you are isn't that certainly how i am and all, all, all the stuff i've always responded to alan bennett onwards is a sort of you know bittersweet that's what i like in comedy and all my favorite comedies are like that there, there, there's those amazing moments when you just suddenly realize that you really care about basil and sybil mm -hmm. and their terrible marriage or you know that amazing episode of steptoe the desperate hours with, with leonard rossiter where two prisoners escape to the junkyard and realize they're better off inside and I mean, they're just fabulous, and and I think it's it's a cliche to say, but it's it's the root of all funny things like that. I think, and and also just that, you know, my favourite bit in that Doctor Who, which I was very privileged to be in, Peter's regeneration story. But when when the Doctor says you're you're, you're a clearly a captain from World War One, and he goes on to speak about the details, and then I say, "What do you mean, one?" And he says, mm -hmm. oh, "Spoilers." And it's, you know, it's beautiful little moments like that. And uh, I think that's what I've always cherished in other people's stuff, and I certainly like to do in my own, is I think it, it's, there's a, I've said this many times, but there's an absolute false, um, it, there's a false distinction between funny and uh, comedy and drama. Uh, the, the, best, the best of both always combine the two. The best make you cry at Norman Stanley Fletcher and then make you laugh at, you know, um, succession or something you know that because people are complicated and and life is so mixed up and full of odd strange moments you there's no point in sort of saying it's one or the other because we all know that's not true it's always it still annoys me that you know you you're almost guaranteed an oscar for, for for doing something which will make people weep and weep and weep and weep and and almost never for making them laugh i mean it's you know it's it's a ridiculous uh, false distinction i think mm. It is, yeah. You're right. I mean, I, I, I find I, it. I find it. it it's interesting. Now, everything I was looking up the other day to watch, all, they were all called uh, comedy drama, mm. and and you go, well, that's what they've always kind yeah, of. That's what yeah. I, <laughs> so you're right. I mean, Steptoe and Son. That there's every time I watch that movie, every time that I notice it's on, because I think it's probably one of the best of the sitcom adaptations. Partly because it comes from one of the best sitcoms, obviously. Mm. But the point in which you realise that he's never going to have happiness that his father, he's always going to be trapped with his father. There's a 10 minute sequence after his marriage, which is, there's no laughs. And it is, it's, it, I still find it 30 years since first seeing it, agony mm. to realize that he will one day be in that house on his own, having found no one because of this trap of, of, of the love and the need for between father and, and son. It's, it's a well, Gold, Goldman Simpson had an idea when, when Wilfred Bramble left uh, uh, to to do a play on Broadway, and he sort of and they, I think I think I'm right in saying this was when they did the '70s revival. You know, whatever happened to Steptoe and Son, essentially, and it was doing very well. But Wilfred Bramble said, "I don't want to do it anymore. I'm going to Broadway." And they had this plan to to uh, to do. He dies. Wilfred Bramble dies. Albert dies, and Harold is finally free. And then this this kid turns up on his doorstep, and it's his illegitimate child. And it all happens again, except now, of course, it's it's stepped on Sonny. And then Wilfred Bramble's play tanked and he just came back and that was the end of that. Well, I mean, that's a great idea, isn't it? He, he just breaks the cycle and then suddenly, oh, no, 
I, I made Star Wars, you know. Wonderful stuff. So, one of my favourite ones is that it's an episode called The Star is Born about amateur dramatics. Harold joins the amateur dramatics. I think it's the one with Joanna Lumley in it. And they have a rehearsal round at the house. And, um, uh, of, and then someone doesn't turn up. And so his dad has to step in. And of course, it's absolutely brilliant. Everyone lionises him and Harold is totally ignored. Mm. And when they do the actual production, he's the, he's the star of the show. And Harold just leaves quietly. Uh, as uh, I think he throws a bottle of whiskey through the window or something like that. And um, this little boy runs up to him for his autograph and says, are you an actor? He says, no, son, I'm a rag and bone man. End. Oh, man. <laughs> it's like Beckett. <laughs> well, there is a, there's a, a, there's wonderf a, a wonderful book uh, by Harry Corbett's uh, daughter all about his, his life, which I would highly recommend. And, and it's so interesting when you find out that he was seen as this kind of, uh, you know, theatrically a Marlon Brando figure when he worked yeah, with, yeah. with oh. Joan Littlewood. Yeah. At, at, yeah. And, and I've, I've read quite a few people uh, who Howard Gurney and people like that who, were, who, who say once Harry Corbett left, it never – that was it. his – being part of Joan Littlewood's very important theatre, that he he was just an incredible powerhouse. She still made great work, but he was he was remarkable. Oh, um, the uh, this is uh, sorry, this is um, oh we've had how would you? What about an update of Sexton Blake? No, great. I like him when they're quick because it means we get all the. Do you think eighties um, hot? Sorry. Oh, no, no, no. You go first if you want, and I'll ask after. No, I was going to say uh, this. That that was from uh, uh, Neil. Uh, Mac would like to know: Do you think eighties horror films nearly killed the genre? Uh, no, they took it somewhere else. I mean, the reason we we stopped the, that original documentary uh, with Halloween is obviously you have to stop somewhere, and also it, it was a it was such a great film. It was a kind of game changer. I mean, the thing is, what happened in the eighties really is that the slasher genre sort of became predominant, didn't it? This and it's, I mean, it's not like there aren't other interesting films being made. It's just a sort of something happened there, which, which took it somewhere else. I don't think, no, I mean, it's like any, it's like music, isn't it? You know, there are period, fallow periods and then something interesting will happen slightly over in the corner and then the whole thing kind of eats itself and then some little new green shoot springs up, like the economy perhaps. Uh, but no, I don't think so. I mean, there's lots to enjoy. It's just, I mean, I have to say, I sound like a terrible old fossil um like this one which i was going to show and tell over the time oh, uh, but, 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 uh, that's the third one but um uh i i, I don't like a lot of 80s movies i mean predominantly i don't like the 80s as a as a decade what about there's a lot of king are you a stephen uh, king fan at all yes i love stephen king although the movies are pretty uh, not very good generally but uh, i love the, the books but it was it's a strange decade i think for the, the 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 big movies the big movies like spielberg movies and things are, are absolutely untouchable but an awful lot of the other stuff um it does nothing for me i find it really it left me cold at the time and, and it does now i just i don't have any fondness for those kind of uh those sort of breakfast club type movies they just don't do it <gasps> they just don't yeah, my, my my wife wanted to watch it the other day, and we started watching it. And I hate it. I hate it because the message because is the message is goths wear a nice white top and wash your hair a bit more, which I think is a very negative. Um, but within twenty minutes, we managed to stop because uh, it's just not a night. Nice, I've never understood that. Or Soul Boy, or Mannequin, or any oh man. I, I feel about this the is Spice Girls. Ah, uh, you see, we've shifted a decade now. <laughs> I'll never, yeah. of course, but yeah, of course, because I'm You'll never get it. No, no, no. No, I'll never, but I, I mean, was... partly that's that's just the inevitability. You know, I remember, I remember talk, talking to someone about Thundercats once, and they were just slavishly in love with it. And I was like, "How can you think that's any good?" And I think, well, that's because you know they're ten years younger than me. That's yeah. it's about that, isn't You're it? You're a child. Yeah, and so you you have all those those lovely nostalgic associations with stuff like that. It doesn't really matter whether it's any good sometimes. But what's what's interesting with the with an adult eye is if you can look back and think, actually, that's rather good. Mm. And a lot of those films, I think, just don't hold up. Ghostbusters is awful. <laughs> <laughs> it's an awful film. It's a clumsy... I just... I, I couldn't believe it when I saw that again. I thought, wow, I thought that was quite something. You know, there are obviously other great movies, but there's a lot of stuff like that where you... you it's really quite a shock. And they, they 
they don't stand up as pieces of movie making the way that other stuff does. Mm. I'm. A, I was always more. I was always more Gremlins than Ghostbusters. Gremlins is amazing. Oh, yeah. yeah, and I, I, I think that's also. Cool. I will defend Gremlins too. I think Gremlins too yeah. is funny and unusual and full of ideas. Oh, it's great. Doctor Catheter. It's, oh. a, it's a late Christopher Lee performance. And, of course, it's it's Trump as well, isn't it? It's Clamp, it's yep, clamp yep. Towers and everything. I mean, they, they saw it all coming. <laughs> We've run out of time. Well, that's genuinely a bit frightening to think that Back to the Future 2 is all based on a sinister universe where Donald Trump is in power. Gremlins 2. I mean, like, we're living in a sequel at the moment. Yeah. Bad sequel. Well, the, the thing that Nostradamus never cottoned on to was what, what we should actually be looking at is The Simpsons, which seems to... <laughs> <laughs> the present we should like, let's go back and have a look at the Simpsons and see what they're uh, what they're saying about next week um, so I'm going to ask you uh, another question bef- or two before we go um, Deborah has asked if you were to write a new Lucifer box book which era do you think would be fun to set it in um, I think because I did it was you know specifically Edwardian the 20s and then the 50s there's a sort of gap there's a gap in the war, probably, sort of 39 and 45, something like that would be quite nice. I think it's unlikely, though. It's Thanks for asking. Um, Olympia wants to know, did you have any inspirations you drew on for your interpretation of Harold in Boys in the Band, which they loved? Oh, thank you. Uh, oh, my goodness. Well, actually, I mean, it's it's very hard to uh, to dislodge uh, Leonard... Um, uh, Leonard Frey uh, from the original, but it, I suppose it, it, it certainly in terms of the look, it was uh, it was Vincent Price's Butch in, uh, in <laughs> Theatre of Blood, the, the, the gay hairdresser. Dishy, dishy hair. That, that was definitely <laughs> in there, I suppose, yes. <laughs> You're going to draw from where you can. Yeah, that's never left me that since I first saw it, that image of Coral Brown being electrocuted by Vincent Price with a bubble perm. That was quite something. <laughs> I, th- I think that and the death, that and the death of Meredith Meridew are my two. Uh, Meredith Meridew, this is your dish. Yeah. Um, they just do that show. It's a great idea. Yeah, but we, 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 without the dog murder. No, no with the with the poodles. Yeah. <laughs> uh, the, uh, um, thank you so much for joining us again. No, at the same time, five weeks. Yeah, yeah, probably. Who um, knows? What sorry, she, sorry, Mark. <laughs> Where we'll be by then? Will we we'll still be here? Oh gosh! What's our backdrop going to be? Be in a I basement w- this time. Yes. Five weeks. <laughs> Just, I'm in. I'm in the shelter. <laughs> well, you see, this is absolutely true. Last thing to say, our house does actually have a secret passage. What? Uh, yeah, it's it's net. We've it, there's a cellar which was filled in in 1970, and underneath that is a doorway to a passage. This is what the old lady we bought it from told us, and we planned to dig out the cellar and reveal the passage. We've never done it. But who knows now? Lockdown. You've had five weeks. We've had five weeks to dig out the cellar manually. <laughs> I'll tell you something. There's a man I'm I'm becoming really, really interested in watching on YouTube and his name is Mr. Twe Sin. And I think he's sort of he could even be 60. He, he lives in Thailand. He's incredibly fit. What he does is he creates these things with a hoe. He goes out into sort of scrubland near where he lives and he hoes out an underground chamber and creates these things. And the videos are called things like 60 days to create millionaire swimming pool underground beach house. And then <laughs> he just whacks it out the ground, digs it out, digs a pool, goes to a nearby oh, river. I've seen that. It's amazing. Well, yes. Yeah. You could, be doing you could be doing 60 days underground, under pool swimming. <laughs> under just house. Give me five weeks. <laughs> or that episode of The Goodies where they were eventually found, where they've, they've been trapped in their, in their yes. little... Oh, so it's going to be one, one or the other. <laughs> Thank you very much, everyone, for watching. Pleasure. We're back tomorrow with uh, Dr. Carl. And uh, Martin Rousen is also going to join us, uh, the brilliant uh, illustrator and, and cartoonist. Mark, thank you so much. And uh, it's, it's, we've, we've got, still got five pages of questions, so we'll do that in five <laughs> weeks. And uh, don't forget, oh, we've also got music from Femi tomorrow as well. And uh, I'll just say again, we've got the tip jar at the bottom. If you are able to give uh, a pound, or you can also, there's other ways you can, you can uh, contribute. We are distributing that money amongst the kind of arts community and uh, to art centres and other things, and uh, that will help a great deal.
Bye, Josie. Bye, Mark. Bye. Thank Bye. you so Thank much. You. I Take hope care. this week is better for everyone. Yeah. Oh.